Good afternoon, um, and it is indeed Friday, although it may not be the end of the week. Um, the Secretary General, as you also spoke at the um, open meeting of the Security Council this morning uh, on the situation in Gaza, he told the members of the Council that he had indeed invoked Article 99 of the UN Charter because we are, quote, at a breaking point. He warned that there is a high risk of the total collapse of the humanitarian support system in Gaza, which would have devastating consequences. While affirming that the United Nations is totally committed to staying and delivering for the people of Gaza, the Secretary General said that under current conditions on the ground, the fulfillment of, his, of, that, of this mandate has become impossible. The conditions for the effective delivery of humanitarian aid no longer exists, he told council members. The Secretary General said that there is no effective protection of civilians, that Gazans are running out of food, that Gaza's health system is collapsing, while needs are escalating. He urged the members of the council to spare no effort to push for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire for the protection of civilians and for the urgent delivery of life-saving aid. The eyes of the world and the eyes of history are watching, he said. Um, Philippe Lazzarini, the Commissioner General of the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, said today that he has written uh, to the President of the UN General Assembly to inform him that UNRWA's ability to continue delivering its mandate in Gaza has now become very limited. In an unprecedented letter, he noted that the constant bombardment and low and irregular flow and, uh, uh, of food and other humanitarian supplies into Gaza compared with the immense needs of displaced people in UNRWA's overcrowded shelters, um, and it's not only overcrowded shelters, but also outside those shelters, adding that more than 130 staff members of UNRWA have been killed, most of them with their families. At least 70% of UNRWA staff have been displaced many multiple times. Mr. Lazzarini said that in his 35 years of work in complex emergencies, he would never have expected to write such a letter predicting the killing of his staff and the collapse of the mandate that UNRWA is expected to fulfill. The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us that last night, 69 trucks carrying humanitarian supplies and 61,000 liters of fuel entered Egypt from Gaza. These quantities are nowhere near sufficient to meet overwhelming humanitarian needs in Gaza, not to mention that the complex lack of safety in Gaza is severely limiting access to people in need. Rafa <coughs> is, was the main governor in Gaza where limited aid distribution took place yesterday. In the adjacent Khan Yunus governorate, except for the delivery of medical supplies to two hospitals, aid distribution largely stopped due to the intensity of the ongoing hostilities. Also yesterday, the World Health Organization delivered trauma and emergency care supplies to the European Gaza Hospital and the Nasser Medical Complex in Khan Yunus to cover the needs of some 4,500 hospital patients. This was the first delivery mission to those hospitals since November 29th, despite active hostilities ongoing in the area. And in a statement uh, that is being issued as we speak, uh, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Sexual Violence in Conflict, Ms. Pramila Patton, expressed her grave concern about emerging reports of sexual violence against both men and women while they were held captive by Hamas in Gaza. She is concerned about civilians still held hostage by Hamas and calls for their immediate, safe, and unconditional release. Ms. Patton, ha Ms. Patton has responded positively to an invitation from the government of Israel to conduct an official visit, which she welcomed as an opportunity to meet with survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, including recently um, released hostage, hostages in order to amplify their voices and hear their testimonies firsthand. As a basis for the United Nations engagement, Ms. Patton calls for robust and independent investigations into all allegations of sexual violence in connection with the current conflict. In this respect, she urges the State of Israel to grant access to United Nations entities with, investigati with an investigative mandate, which have, prom which, wh which have promptly signaled their availability and willingness to examine the scope and the extent of these crimes, including allegations of sexual uh, violence against Palestinians. Uh, that has been shared with you. Um, 
also today, uh, not surprisingly, the Secretary General will be uh, leaving New York. Uh, he'll be heading first to Doha and Qatar this evening to take part in the Doha Forum, whose theme is uh, Building Shared Futures. On Sunday, Mr. Guterres will speak at the opening session where he'll underscore that humanity shares one destiny in one planet and is currently facing multiple challenges, including geopolitical divide, global inequalities, raging conflicts, and climate chaos, among others. He will call for a serious effort to bring global structures up to date, rooting in equ e equality and solidarity based on the UN Charter and international law. While in Doha, he will also have bilateral meetings. And on Sunday evening, the Secretary General will head back uh, to the United Arab Emirates, to Dubai, to, a, to for the UN Climate Conference. As in previous years, he will meet with various officials and groups at COP28 before the conference is scheduled to end on Tuesday. We will have him back here on Wednesday. Um, uh, also, I want to flag that this afternoon, Rosemary DiCarlo, the Under Secretary General for Peace Building and Political Affairs, will be speaking to the Security Council in a closed session. Um, to brief them on the situation between Guyana and Venezuela. That will take place in close consultations. Also, I want to tell you that the Secretary General welcomes the joint statement issued by Armenia and Azerbaijan announcing a series of confidence-building measures and reaffirming their commitment to normalize bilateral relations. The United Nations encourages the parties to build on the agreement to advance mutual confidence and secure long-term peace for the benefit of their population and the region. Yesterday afternoon or early evening, um, you will recall we issued a statement on Haiti in which the Secretary General expressed his concern over the limited progress of inter-Haitian dialogue towards lasting and inclusive political solutions to restore the country's democratic institutions. He extends his full support to the efforts of the CARICOM eminent persons groups and to the UN uh, office in uh, Haiti. Um, to facilitate sustainable and nationally owned solutions to Haiti's political crisis. Um, also from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, our colleagues in the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs say they are concerned by the escalation of hostilities in the country's east, specifically in North Kivu's Masisi territory. Yesterday morning, local sources reported that people in several villages were fleeing their homes near Mushaki, about 45 kilometers from Goma, due to fighting between the Congolese army and armed groups. One of the villages in, in impacted is Bihambwe, a place where thousands of men, women, and children have sought refuge, uh, which, had been which has now been emptied of its civilian population, including some 60,000 displaced people who'd arrived between October and November. Humanitarian access is severely limited there. Traffic is reportedly cut off on the road linking Goma to the center of Masisi. And as you can imagine, it's likely to hamper the work of aid organizations. Despite the difficulties, humanitarian partners have maintained their presence and are supporting communities impacted by the violence. Between July and October, aid organizations provided um, more support to more than uh, support to three million of the more than five million people in urgent need of assistance in North Kivu, South Kivu, and Ituri provinces. But as we often tell you, lack of funding for the humanitarian response in the DRC remains a critical challenge. To date, the $2.25 billion appeal to reach 10 million people in the DRC is less than 40% funded at $861 million. Senior personnel announcement to share with you. Uh, the Secretary General is appointing Anita Kiki uh, Gebeho, excuse me, of Ghana as his new Deputy Special Representative for the UN uh, mission in South Sudan, and she will also serve as the resident coordinator in South Sudan. She will also serve as the humanitarian coordinator. Three hats. Triple-hatted people, as we call them here. Uh, Ms. Gebeho succeeds uh, Sarah Nyanti of Liberia, to whom the Secretary General is grateful for her dedication and service to the UN. Uh, Ms. Gebeho brings over 25 years of experience in strategic planning, coordination, management, and political development and humanitarian affairs at UN headquarters and in diverse conflict and post-conflict settings. Most recently, she was the dep Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General in the UN assistance mission in Somalia, a post she's had since 2021. We congratulate her. 
The high-level advisory body on artificial intelligence uh, that was meeting yesterday, it continued its meeting today and they're wrapping them up. Members have been discussing maximizing the benefits of artificial intelligence and ensuring that its risks are diminished. The Secretary General is telling the group today that he looks forward to their recommendations. The interim report um, containing preliminary recommendations will be finalized by the end of the year. Uh, some of you, uh, I think Toshi uh, asked me about this yesterday, and what I can tell you is that the interim report will be made public in early January, uh, but the exact publication date is not yet clear. Um, a broader and deeper report will be published next summer before the Summit of the Future. The interim report will represent the experts' group's views on the governance, opportunities, and risks of AI. All stakeholders will have a chance to give their opinions and engage with the work of the body um, next year. And I also want to tell you that since uh, this group was launched on the 26th of October of this year, members have held around 40 meetings in smaller working group formats. They've also met uh, as a whole on the 27th of October online. The next online meeting will be on 18th of December, and this week's meeting is the second plenary session. And the first in person, uh, there we go. Um, maybe my phone. Um, also today, the Peacebuilding Support Office of the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, in collaboration with its partners, launched the Peacebuilding Impact Hub. This initiative within the UN system offers a platform to unite governments, think tanks, academia, civil society, uh, civil society peace builders to foster collective efforts to enhance evidence-based operational, political, and strategic insights. The collaborations aim to bolster the effectiveness of peacebuilding work, aligning humanitarian, human rights, and development actions to contribute significantly to the establishment of enduring and sustainable peace. The Peacebuilding Impact Hub was launched during an event co-hosted today by Canada, by Costa Rica, Germany, and South Sudan, and took place earlier in the um, premises of the permanent mission of Canada to these United Nations. More information on the Impact Hub is available on the UN Peacebuilding website. Also, I want to, uh, programming note, I want to flag um, to you that on Monday, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is launching its Global Humanitarian Overview for 2024. This is the annual overview of humanitarian trends and needs worldwide, as well as interagency plans to respond to, cr to, the cries, to the crisis. It also includes a summary of the funding needed to implement the plans over the coming years. The Global Humanitarian Overview will be launched in Doha by Mr. Martin Griffiths, our Emergency Relief Coordinator, and in Geneva by the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Joyce Misuya. It will also be launched in Addis Ababa by Ramesh Rajasingham, OCHA's Director of Coordination Division, and the Secretary General will have a pre-recorded video which we will share. Food price index, um, our friends in Rome at the Food and Agricultural Organization. Very nice place to work. Uh, reports that the benchmark for world food com uh, commodity prices was broadly stable in November with lower international cereal quotations offset by higher vegetable oils, by the prices of, of the higher prices of vegetable oils. The FAO food price index, which tracks monthly changes um, in the international prices of a set of globally traded food commodities, averaged 120.4 points in November, unchanged from the level uh, in the previous month, October, and 10.7% lower than in November of 2022. Um, someone asked me about uh, Mr. Lamamra's activities um, yesterday, about the, the Secretary General's personal envoy for Sudan, and I can tell you that Mr. Lamamra has assumed his functions and is on his way to Djibouti to attend the IGAD summit in Sudan, which I think takes place December uh, I think today and tomorrow. Uh, and he will thereafter come back to New York for a series of internal and external consultations. Uh, mark your calendars. We have a few international days this weekend. Uh, tomorrow is the International Day of Commemoration of the, and the Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and the Prevention of this Crime. Tomorrow is also the International Anti-Corruption Day. And we flagged to you earlier that this week, the 10th session of the Conference of Parties, States Parties to the Convention 
against corruption is being held in Atlanta, Georgia from the 11th to the 15th of December. And uh, Human Rights Day is observed on Sunday. The Secretary General starts his message with the iconic opening sentence of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. It's an important, it, as important today as it was when it was adopted 75 years ago, warning that the world is losing its way. The Secretary General urges people to promote and respect human rights. Will you respect my human rights? Anadia? Will you answer my question? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a question about today's Security Council meeting on Gaza. In the meeting, Israel's ambassador to the UN said that Israel agreed to increase the amount of fuel entering Gaza, and yesterday the entry of 65 aid trucks was facilitated, but this number could have been much higher if the UN's capacity to accept more trucks permitted this. He then went on to say there are currently hundreds of aid trucks in a log jam waiting to enter Gaza after security inspection, and the only reason they have not entered is because of the logistical difficulties of international organizations. And so my question is, does it, what is the UN reaction, first of all? And second of all, it seems to be that the Israelis are saying the UN is holding up the aid. Uh, we are not holding up aid. We are trying to push through as many, uh, as, as the largest possible volume of aid into Gaza uh, under complicated and complex uh, procedures. What is your response to Israeli saying it's UN capacity that's limiting how much aid that goes in? No, the, the, we have uh, many trucks that are waiting to go, uh, to go in, and we are pushing them through this complex maze, so to speak, as quickly as possible. Last follow-up. So it seems on the Israeli side of this complex maze, the UN is the holdup. On the UN side of this complex maze, what is the holdup? The holdup is that we're dealing with a conflict situation, right? We're trying to get aid into an area where there is, uh, where there is an active conflict going on, uh, where there are security, security procedures uh, have to be respected, um, that it's not as simple as opening up a gate and driving a truck through it. Ms. Falk, then Mr. Deji. Uh, thank you, Steph. On the same front, how much do you think the opening of Karam Shalom crossing will help? And uh, what's your, what is the UN opinion of Muwasi, I think it's uh, the new safe zone uh, that Israel designated. Thank well, you. Uh, on the safe zones, I think we've made ourselves uh, we've made ourselves clear. Uh, we have been engaging uh, and continue to engage with Israeli authorities uh, on all the options to increase the delivery and volume of aid into Gaza. Our understanding is that Karim Shalom will be opened up as an additional inspection point, not as an additional entry point, which means that trucks will still have to go to Rafah. Uh, which it, it makes things a little simpler in the sense that th there is a uh, inspection uh, facilities and protocol that are well established at Karim Shalom. We continue to press for the opening of the Karim Shalom um, uh, crossing, um, and of course, you know the what. What will make the delivery of aid that much easier are safe conditions on the ground, which we currently do not have, I think, as Philippe Lazzarini very eloquently uh, wrote, and as the Secretary General has been saying. Uh, Deji, then Ephraim, then Don. Uh, during the Security Council meeting, we heard very clearly that uh, the Secretary General is for an, an immediate ceasefire, which actually there is also a draft resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. Many member states also stress, stress that they, they, need, they, they, need, they need to have an immediate uh, ceasefire in Gaza. But the United States seems not to, would not support that idea. Uh, given the fact that the Secretary General today is leaving for Doha, uh, and the post and and the voting is postponed to this the afternoon. What what efforts can he make for this short period of time? Will he talk to let's say Look, Blinken? Uh, he has uh, the secretary general continues uh, to be in touch with um, senior foreign policy officials, foreign ministry minister officials are, are across the board. But let let let's be clear. The secretary general wrote his art, article ninety nine letter. 
a message to the Security Council, a rather dramatic and clear message. The, the next step is for the Council to have its deliberations, to work out its processes, to work out what will come out of that deliberations. The Secretary General is not a negotiating partner. Uh, in those discussions. It is up to the 15 uh, to do that. But I believe I believe the Secretariat has already seen the, the draft resolution. Would the Secretary I mean, General I, support I think support a lot of that? journalists have already seen the draft yes. resolution. So, so will, will the Secretary General support that well, very short... A, the Secretary uh, General draft. does not have a vote. There are 15 seats around the Council. He does have a seat, but I don't think I've but ever seen... But he has the opinion, I, I, right? I've never seen a Secretary General uh, vote. Uh, of course, the Secretary General has an opinion. Mm -hmm. So what he's what's but his it, it is not uh, useful mm -hmm. uh, for any secretary general to get uh, to voice an opinion or get involved in the, in those deliberations. Then moving to Doha, will the secretary general talking about the the release of hostages? Yes, he will. He will be speaking uh, with senior government officials in in, in Doha, and that is uh, uh, as he's done in the past and has continued uh, to do. Ephraim. Thank you, Steph. Uh, on Ms. Patton's call for a robust and independent investigation into allegations of uh, sexual violence on, uh, uh, after the October 7th attack, uh, I mean, sexual violence by Hamas, and as you said, she called for the UN relevant entity mm -hmm. to conduct investigation um, and, and for Israel to allow uh, the relevant uh, investigators uh, to, to access. Uh, but when it comes to the claims by the Palestinian women and Israeli Jays that have also uh, claimed that there, were, um, um, that there has been sexual violence against them, including threats with rape, I, I what think kind every, of investigation? Every, everything has to be investigated, and I would urge you to read the, her press release in detail. She mentions that too. I, okay. Yeah, I would. Thank it's it's in her yeah. box. That's okay. Don. Thank you. Um, I have two follow-ups from the Security Council meeting. Uh, U.S. Ambassador Wood said that, quote, we have supported establishing a more effective humanitarian deconfliction mechanism with the U.N. and we are monitoring its implementation. Are you aware of this? Can you provide any further details? Of course. We, I mean, um, uh, as, as Ambassador Wood uh, said, the U.S. has been a critical partner of ours uh, in discussions with the Israeli authorities and others in deconfliction. This has been uh, really from the start of the um, the start of the conflict. What's a de humanitarian deconfliction? Deconfliction mechanism? is is it, it, deconfliction mechanism is something we have in place mm -hmm. in conflict zones, whether in Syria, whether in Ukraine, and now in in Gaza and, and other places, which means that we communicate uh, to the warring parties, uh, the UN. Um, UN movements of humanitarian, uh, UN humanitarian movements, and also places where humanity, uh, UN premises and, and and shelters are. Is that working? Okay. Um, um, Israeli Ambassador Erdan also said, "quote that Israel has facilitated the construction of two field hospitals." one run by the Kingdom of Jordan, mm -hmm. the other by the UAE. And then he also mentioned that France is coordinating a floating hospital. Yeah. Is the UN aware of this, involved I mean, in we, any way? We're aware. We, we know there were airdrops, I think, of uh, the two field hospitals. We're, we've seen the press reports and aware of the French hospital ship off the coast of, uh, of Egypt. Yes, sir, and then we'll go to the screen. Thank you. Uh, your, your microphone, please, close to your mouth. Sorry. It's Lablon, sir, from Bangladesh. Protein. Yes. Obviously, I ask for about Bangladesh. Yes. I have two questions. United Nations will mark the 75th anniversary of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide and the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide. We appreciate that. However, I regret to share with you that the United Nations is yet to take action to recognize the genocidal action committed by occupying force in Bangladesh during its liberation war in 1971. I'd like so, to hear so you I, I, kind comments First, first of all, I'm, I'm, uh, w with all due respect to historical uh, events and those who suffered during those historical events, I will not comment on things that happened that long ago. Uh, second, as we've said here repeatedly over and over again, it is not for the Secretary General 
to designate an event as genocide. It is up to competent judicial authorities. So what is your other question? Yeah, Bangladesh is committed to hold a free, fair, and inclusive election and would welcome all cooperation from democratic allies. Is United Nations planning to send observer in Bangladesh during its national election? No, the, the United Nations uh, in, in very recent, I mean, does, in my memory, without a specific mandate, does no longer send uh, observers. Thank you. Uh, uh, Abdel Hamid, then Mushfik, and then Stefano. So thank you, Stefan. I want to follow up with a question that my uh, colleague from Islam asked yesterday about uh, the Palestinians who were uh, arrested by Israelis and they were seated on the ground and stripped naked. And you know how that humiliation, uh, what, what kind of humiliation it means to the Palestinian community. And first, did the SJC see that? Did, did you personally see the, the picture? I, I, I saw, I saw, yes, I saw, I saw, I saw the news coverage and I commented on it yesterday. Okay. Now, someone like Thor Winston, who's supposed to be there, how could this incident with that magnitude pass it without any kind of reference or comment? Well, I was asked about it and I commented on it. I know I'm asking about Paul Winston. Well, ask, I mean, I, listen, we're, we're, we're going to have this conversation in a circle okay. again, uh, but I, all I can say is I, I was asked about it and I commented on it. Fine. Okay. Fine. My second question. In many of the statements, including one PSG, he keeps talking about the sexual violence of Palestinians. And you just said it was not investigated yet. Sorry, he was, talking, the Israeli, he was talking. He was talking. It was an about, Israeli narrative uh, okay. that the Palestinian committed sexual violence against yeah. the captives. It has not been proven. Why repeat something that has not been proven? When you know, and I know, everything Israel said was uh, was lies. Well, for, first of all, for, first, 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 first of all, Abdel Hamid, you may know some things, but don't say that. I know and you know. So please do not assume what I, I know. What I, no, no, because that's what that's I mean, what you just that's what that's what that's what that's what you just said. Uh, it is clear. To, th there are certain things oh. that are that that are clear, and the Secretary General referred to uh, those incidents of sexual uh, violence um, uh, that you raise on on October seventh because. It is fairly clear that these things happened. What is your next question, sir? I mean, is he sure that these? I, I, I've answered. I've answered. Abdel Hamid, I've answered your question. He is. If, if he he doesn't say, I mean, I, I've known Antonio Guterres now for seven years, six years. I, he doesn't say things that he doesn't want to say. Okay. Uh, uh, Mushfik. Thank you, Stefan. Bangladesh regime seeking UN support, terming people demands for democratic and voting rights as unwarranted vested political pressure before election, as Foreign Minister Moment sent a letter to SG, according to media reports. What is your response? And does the Secretary General award that regime prepping for another one-sided election, putting the main I opposition in the jail? I haven't seen the, the letter, and I would just refer you to what I've already said extensively mm -hmm. uh, on the elections in Bangladesh and our hopes for free, fair, uh, and, and credible uh, elections. Uh, Stefano, and then we'll go back to the room because somebody just walked in. Thank you, Stefan. Um, the Israeli ambassador, Tan, during the Security Council, Meeting, uh, he uh, said that uh, he mentioned the war in Ukraine and other wars, and they said that the Secretary General never acted like he did now with the, the letter to the Security Council under Article 99. Is there uh, any response on that? Well, the response is that, you know. 
one may criticize Antonio Guterres for what he does and what he doesn't do. But I can tell you that what he does, he does it because he's thought it out. Um, the implication in the, and I'm not referring to Ambassador Adam, but the implication, some of the criticism we've heard, is that he hasn't done anything for any of the other conflicts that are listed. And I think those of you who have been covering him and covering this organization since he started know very well uh, that he's been deeply involved and speaking out uh, on the, the killings of civilians in all of these conflicts. Um, Miss, what, what is your name? The CNN guy in the back, yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Richard, how are My you? My first question to you in four years. Um, uh, it's sort of an inside, outside housekeeping matter. Uh -oh. uh, walked in today, maybe you saw this. Uh, there it could be any group, but this time it was uh, 10 women or so holding and yelling about free Palestine. I don't recall in the 30 or 40 years demonstrators allowed on the sidewalk in front of the building. I presume the sidewalk is viewed as New York property, but they may have been moved, they may have disappeared, but is the UN now allowing that? Normally they're in Ralph Bunch Park. Maybe they didn't want to go there because there's a giant menorah. Uh, I've missed you, Richard. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, uh, all this to say is that, A, we are strong believers and defenders in the right to demonstrate freely and uh, peacefully. Um, second, as you, as you mentioned, the sidewalk is the responsibility of uh, the host uh, country. We remain in constant touch with uh, especially the NYPD, the local precinct, who have been fantastic in uh, uh, helping us keep the building safe and all of us who work here uh, safe. So um, it, it's not a matter of us allowing them or not allowing them. Uh, it is not for us to grant or not grant these permission, but it's important for us that people be able to speak freely. Senora. Idoyana, I'm from El Periodico. Uh, the Secretary General has invoked Article 99. He came today, he spoke very clearly. You said he doesn't have the power to vote, but what are his next? steps. If the Security Council today or whenever it is doesn't vote, he invokes it again, he comes again. What are his well, next I, I steps? I think the, the, the next step is step by step. Okay, so uh, because telling you what the next step would be would be uh, me predicting what will happen in the Security Council. So I think he called for the international community, for Security Council members uh, to take their responsibilities. Let's see what happens in the council, and then we'll take it from there. But the United States representative said today at the Security Council, we are not supporting uh, a ceasefire. I, I, I'm very well aware of what is being said uh, in the Security Council. Linda Fasulo, and then I think we will call it a day. <clears throat> um, uh, thank you, Steph. I, um, we know, obviously, that the Security Council, the member, certain members are calling for a ceasefire. Um, and the Secretary, and of course, we've had humanitarian pauses, and people talk about humanitarian truces leading to a potential ceasefire. I believe that's the French. What is the Secretary General's interpretation of a humanitarian ceasefire? I mean, just very clear. Yeah, I, I, is it, this it, a permanent it's, ceasefire it's, it's, it's leading very, to it's political very, It's very discussions? simple. It is a ceasefire agreed upon for humanitarian purposes. But is it permanent, meant to be permanent, or just for an occasional temporary amount well, of I time? Well, I think there's a difference. To, I mean, we're, we're, uh, there are differences between pause and ceasefire. Uh, so for us, a humanitarian ceasefire is a ceasefire for humanitarian purposes. Deji, you're pushing it, but go ahead. It's Friday. <laughs> yeah. Happy Friday. Uh, so, last question. In the beginning of the of the Gaza operation by Israeli military, they first pushed everybody from north to south. I mean, does the UN have any contact with them? Like, it seems they finished their their, their northern operation. Why wouldn't they allow civilians to go back? Uh, ask your correspondent in uh, Jerusalem or in Tel Aviv to ask the, the IDF that question. But w will, I, I mean, I, you know, we're, we're obviously in touch with them, mm -hmm. but I'm, it's not for me to speak to uh, their, their military operations. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. No Monica today. Thanks, Steph. You're welcome. <laughs>